Hello, everybody. So far in our study of time uh, complexity, we have defined it. Uh, we studied basic uh, properties of time complexity like the time hierarchy theorem. We looked at the robustness uh, of uh, time complexity to different uh, models uh, of computation, consider the extended uh, church during thesis. And then uh, we defined P, which is a, a robust uh, class of uh, uh, polynomial time computations, every language that can be decided by polynomial time computation. And we defined NP, which is the analog for non-deterministic computation. And we actually uh, try to understand it as uh, polynomial time deciding versus polynomial time verifying. And the last thing we did uh, before this video is to uh, revisit our old friend, which is mapping reductions, but instead define polytime reductions, which are just like mapping reductions with uh, the added constraint that the reduction itself is polynomial time. This will play a major role in defining this uh, new notion of NP completeness. It's going to play a major role uh, in, in uh, this video. And in general, in the study of uh, the P versus NP problem. So what is an NP complete problem? A language B is NP complete. First, it is within NP. And second, every other problem within NP is polytime reducible to B. Uh, so every A in NP uh, satisfies A polytime reducible to B. This second property is called uh, NP hardness. So then we'll say that B is NP hard because it is as hard, at least as hard as any other problem within NP. So to be NP complete, you, you have to be within NP and also NP hard. And um, proving that B is in NP is uh, often forgotten when you prove NP completeness uh, in uh, problem sets. So this is something to remind yourself. I want to say that we already seen this notion of completeness uh, implicitly, implicitly when we discussed uh, things uh, in um, about computability. So in homework, you will show or have shown that the language L is recognizable if and only if uh, L is mapping reducible to ATM. So what do we have? We have that ATM is recognizable and every other language that is recognizable is mapping reduced to ATM. So in this sense, ATM is complete for recognizable languages. And we will look at problems that are complete uh, for, um, uh, for NP. So suppose the language L is NP complete what we have is that every other uh, language within NP is mapping reduced to, to L. What does it mean? It means that if L is in P, then every other language is in P because every other language reduces to L, which is in P. So then P equals NP. And if L is not in P, then P is definitely not equal to NP. So, because we saw a problem within NP that is not in P. So, instead of trying to ask if two classes of languages are the same, we are now left with a question about a single problem, a single language. And it is to, to answer uh, the complexity of this uh, single problem. So, for every problem that is NP complete, deciding if P equals NP, boils down to asking if there is a polynomial time algorithm for this problem. So this is pretty amazing. That's not the end of the story, but that's one motiv big motivation for discussing NP completeness. And if you re uh, remember in uh, one of the first videos when I discussed this coloring problem that is NP complete, I said that deciding if this problem is decidable within polynomial time uh, this is one of the major problems in uh, mathematics. Uh, it sounded perhaps a bit fishy, but 
this is the context. So if L is not in P, then P is not uh, equal to in P. So uh, L, equal, L is in P if and only if P equals in P. Um, so suppose L is NP complete, assuming the conjecture that P is different than NP, L is not decidable in any polynomial time, any time n to the k for every k. Now, that's great. I mean, it's wonderful to have complete problems. Uh, in fact, uh, this separates uh, classes for which we know more from classes uh, for which we know less, often classes that we don't have complete problems or classes we can say less things about it. But it is not interesting, this notion is not interesting if there is no NP complete problem. And that's where the main uh, item on, our, on this video comes, which is the cook leving theorem. And this is that there is an NP complete problem uh, it comes from logic, it's uh, SAT and 3SAT that we discussed uh, in one of the previous videos. And uh, this, uh, Cook, this is called cook levin theorem because each one of them uh, proved it. Uh, cook uh, proved it uh, uh, in the US and uh, uh, Levin proved it in the USSR. And at that time, the level of communication between the US and USSR uh, was very limited. So uh, they only found out about it uh, several years uh, later. So this is the Cook Living Theorem, very important uh, in the study of anti-completeness. So uh, we want to prove that 3SAT is in NP and that's most of the remaining vi uh, video will be about that. And uh, the first part to show that it's NP complete is to show that it is an, in NP. Um, but uh, that we already proved, uh, right? Because the assignment itself is a proof that uh, the three CNF formula is satisfiable. So that's something we already done uh, before. And the second part is to show that the uh, three SAT is NP hard. That's of course the main course. Every language in NP can be polynomial time reduced to three set. And this will give us some kind of complex logical formula that will capture that other computation. So a uh, corollary is uh, that three set is in P if and only if P equals NP. So again, we have a single problem that uh, captures the entire question of P versus NP. Here is uh, the proof idea. We already uh, did three sets in NP. And then now we want to prove that uh, every language uh, in NP reduces to three set. Uh, and uh, for that, we'll give a polynomial time reduction from A to three set. So this reduction will convert an input of A to a three CM CNF formula phi with the property that W is in A if and only if uh, phi is in three set. So that's interesting. I mean, no matter what language it is in NP, no matter if it's a language that captures something in biology, uh, like protein folding or something in economics or in optimization, we somehow want to turn it into a formula. And it seems challenging. Uh, and the property we will use, so we will definitely not go one problem at a time and try to understand it and why it has within it some kind of a logic formula. We will use the one property that holds for every language in NP. And this is that there is a non-deterministic polynomial time a Turing machine that uh, accepts A. So for every A in NP, there is let n be the non-deterministic Turing machine that decides a in time n to the k. So for some k, such a, such n exists. And in a sense, phi will simulate n on w. 
So we are going to see how a logical formula can simulate, can capture a computation of a non-deterministic machine on an input W. So let's remind ourselves uh, what are these non-deterministic computations? Deterministic computations is just a list of, uh, of uh, moves, deterministic, that leads to an accept or reject. In non-deterministic computation, at every step, you can move uh, in one of several ways. And uh, this means that you don't have a single path of computation, a single possible path you have uh, many potential paths. So if the length of the computation is n to the k, as we discussed, the number of possible leaves or the number of possible paths that we can take can be exponential in n to the k. Even if at any given point, the machine can make one of two moves, you have two to the n to the k. Now this is too large, we want a formula that will have a polynomial size, some size that is polynomial in n to the k. We cannot try to capture and say, okay, which would have been an approach is to say, look at this path. Uh, so either this path is an accepting path or this path is an accepting path or this path is an accepting path for all possible paths. This will give us a formula that's uh, way too large. So in our encoding of a computation, we'll need to be smarter. And for this, we're going to use uh, this notion of a tableau. So a tableau uh, of the, for the computation of N on W is uh, just a table uh, of uh, size N to the K uh, times uh, N to the K. Um, so n to the k uh, corresponds to the uh, bound on the computation time on n to the w, um, whose rows are configurations uh, of some uh, possible computation history n on w. So we cannot uh, specifically go over all possible paths. So instead, the tableau would capture an abstract path, a sequence of configurations. Um, the first row is just going to be the starting configuration, which we know we start with Q0, which is the first state, and then it, and it, the head looks at the leftmost symbol W1, and then you have W2, Wn, and, uh, and so forth. Why can we say that each row has length at most n to the k? For that, we're going to use a fact that we actually already used, that in time n to the k, the machine can only touch n to the k cells. So we don't need to worry and need to encode in our configuration cells that go beyond this n to the k. Now each cell uh, contains a symbol uh, from the encoding of uh, uh, a configuration. So we remember that a configuration has either a state, every cell, uh, every symbol of the configuration is either the state of the machine, so Q, or an alphabet symbol, or this uh, special symbol sharp that is going to separate one from the other. Uh, a tableau is accepting if the last row of the tableau is an accepting configuration. Right? We said the configuration path uh, is accepting if the last row is accepting, meaning that there is an accept state within this configuration. And accept W if and only if there is a legal accepting tableau for N on W. Given W, we'll construct a 3CNF formula, Fe, with order of the length of W to the 2K clauses. And this uh, will describe the constraints that uh, this tableau corresponds to an accepting path. 
So this is an accepting tableau for n on w. Uh, the three sine formula phi, that's what we need, is going to be satisfiable if and only if there is an accepting tableau for n on w. So that's kind of the, the plan. What are uh, the variables uh, of formula phi? Right, so to describe a, a formula, we need to say what are the variables and then what are the clauses. Um, so let C be all the union of the symbols that could be, uh, the set of symbols that could be part of a tableau. Each of the n to the k squared entries of the tableau is a cell that contains uh, some value in C. Uh, cell ij is the value uh, of cell in row i and column j. Row i is the ith, uh, the ith configuration in the tableau, and column j is the j symbol in this configuration. So the j symbol in the ith configuration. For every i and j, and for every symbol, we're going to have a Boolean variable x i j s uh, in phi. And this uh, variable is going to correspond, right, variables are, if we could have in a variable a uh, symbol from uh, C, we will just need one of these variables for every cell, but we cannot. Uh, a variable is true or false. This is a Boolean formula. So for every possible symbol that can be there, we will place a variable that says, in this cell, we have uh, this uh, symbol. So X i j s corresponds to S uh, appears in cell i j. The total number of variables is C times N to the two K. And since C is a uh, constant, this is order N to the two K. And the variables x, uh, i, j, s, all the variables in the formula, uh, represent the content of the cells. So x, i, j, s, when you look at all the possible s, will capture what is the content uh, of uh, cell i, j. And we, will, uh, we want to interpret it as x, i, j, s equals one, if and only if cell i, j, is uh, equals s. So every, uh, for every uh, tableau, we will have a, an assignment for all these variables that captures uh, the tableau. The idea is to make phi so that every satisfying assignment to the variables x, i, j, s corresponding to an accepting tableau for n on w. And so an assignment uh, to all the cells in the tableau, uh, that will be an accepting tableau. So we need to make sure that uh, the only way to get an accept, uh, a satisfying assignment is by encoding in a sense an accepting tableau. And that once you have an accepting tableau, you can encode, you have a satisfying assignment. The formula will capture various properties that we need to, to have. Uh, we'll have phi cell that will uh, guarantee that indeed the assignment corresponds to a value uh, of the tableau. So uh, let me see exactly what we mean here. We'll have a formula that, um, that corresponds to the first row being a uh, the start, the start uh, configuration, we have phi except that correspond to the last row being an accepting configuration. And we have phi move, which will be the most challenging one that will tell us that uh, indeed, uh, if we have a legitimate configuration in row i, then, uh, then we will have a legitimate configuration in i plus one, which is, uh, 
So it's the, the, the first configuration yields the second one. So if we sell for all i, j, there is a unique s in C with x, i, j, s equals one. If we start the first row of the table uh, equals the start of configuration of n on w, if we accept is that the last row of the table as an accept state. And if we move is that every row is a configuration that yields the configuration on the, state, on the next row. And we'll do it one by one. And once we have all of them, we will be happy. So a uh, few cell is easy. For every i, j, there is a unique s uh, with x, i, j, s being one. This is what we want to do. So a uh, phi cell will go over all possible cells, all i, j. So it's the conjunction of all i, j uh, uh, larger than one and smaller than n to the k, at most n to the k, of the, the property that you want for cell, for this particular cell. And this uh, so was the property. First, you want that the OR of X, I, J, S is one, meaning that there is at least one X, I, J, S uh, that is set to one. And on the other end, you don't want to have two. So, and all pairs of symbols, and uh, you want that at least one of them is zero. So either not X, I, J, S or not X, I, J, T. Uh, for every st in c. So this formula is of constant size. This is uh, of size, uh, uh, the size of c, and this is the size of c squared. And you look at every table. So the length of this formula is n to the k, n to the uh, order n to the 2k. For all ij, at least one xij s is set to one, and at most one xij s is set to one. If we start, the first row of the table equals the start configuration of n on w. Uh, given that uh, we create this reduction, we know w, then this is easy. We know exactly what the content of every uh, cell going to be, and we're just going to insist it, on it. So x11 one, one, uh, sharp and x12 q0 and x13 w1 and x14 w2 and so on and so forth. So we know exactly what is supposed to be in every cell and we just have a formula that asks, um, uh, that asks uh, for all of these to hold. The last one is also not difficult. The last row of the table has an accept state. So this is just OR on J from one to two to the K of X and K. We only care now about the last row, J, Q accept. And um, so, one of these symbols is going to be Q except. One of these cells have Q except. Okay. Now we really want to, uh, to work and uh, we want to, to show that every row is a configuration that yields the configuration on the next row. And this is uh, the heart of the reduction. And this is also where we are using the fact that uh, the notion of computation that we have is very local. If you remember in uh, one of the first videos, uh, I discussed this notion of computation as uh, the evolution of the environment by a sequence of uh, simple local operations. And here is exactly why we need these operations to be local. The key observation, if one row yields the next row, that there are not many cells that uh, are changed between one row and the other. It's very local change. And how many uh, cells are affected? Uh, at most uh, three cells uh, in each one of these rows. So there is a three by two window uh, in the tableau, which is the only thing that changes between the two uh, rows. And so for example, here, we see that the state 
uh, q1 is q1 and that you're looking at b and now uh, you can change b here b is changed to c and you can move uh, to the right or to the left here you move to the left and move to q2 so this a is has moved one to the right this q1 moved here and actually changed and this has changed as well this is the cell so this three by two window is the only thing that changed and this is uh, true always right let me do it again for emphasis um so the idea now is to check every two by three window of cells and check that each one of those is a legal uh, transition. It's something that can happen based on uh, how n operates. And we'll argue that uh, if all of these are correct, then the entire row yields the other, the next row. In fact, uh, it will almost always mean that you need to have equality because a window that doesn't include the state uh, will, will have a difficult time uh, changing. It can change on the edges. Um, so let's see an example. Uh, you have a Turing, uh, not a Turing machine, and uh, and suppose you have these transitions and furthermore, uh, assume that uh, here, uh, let's look at a situation where you are in Q1 and looking at B. So we need to look at Delta Q1B and we see that there are two transitions and each one of them uh, can cause a different uh, six, uh, uh, a two by three uh, table. So if you look at Q1 and B, and let's say you take the, the transformation to Q2 that uh, writes here C and move to the left, you will get this. So given this transformation and this uh, beginning of the first row, this is what you're going to see. Um, if, um, you, uh, you're here in the same thing. You can also take the other transformation with Q2 and writes A and move to the right. And this will give us this two by three. If we have the first row A, A, Q1, then uh, potentially we have uh, this uh, transition. So perhaps we are writing a B and moving to the right. And this is what we'll see here in this table. Know that uh, um, there is a, a since we're only looking at uh, a two by three uh, windows, there is a, a constant number of possible configurations for them, and we can look at each one of them and and look at at uh, the uh, transitions and ask: Is it possible? Is there any way in which we can see this kind of a table? Um, so these are all consistent uh, transitions. And here are a few examples of inconsistent transitions. I want to say that these are just part of all the possible, uh, all the possible uh, con configurations of the table. Uh, so for example, ABA, AAA, uh, cannot be possible. In fact, there is no way to change the middle uh, symbol by itself without seeing Q at all. And uh, and you can look at uh, the rest. For example, you cannot create two instances uh, of, uh, of Q2. This is just not a possible table. So you can look at, at every two by three there are a constant number of, of these and we can divide them to uh, legal and illegal, possible or impossible. And uh, the key idea which needs a proof but it's not uh, too hard is that if every window of the tableau is legal 
in the top row is the start configuration. Then each row of the tableau is a configuration that yields the next row of the tableau. So if we start with the legal row for the beginning and each uh, window is legal, then uh, the entire tableau will be legal in the sense that each configuration will yield the other. The proof uh, sketch is by strong induction on the row. Strong induction means that you assume by induction every A uh, that it holds for every previous value. So the bottom of the uh, induction has to do with the first and second row, so a table that is between the first and second row. The top row is a configuration, and uh, if it does not yield the, ne the next row, then there is a two by three window that is illegal. Uh, so that, again, actually needs uh, to be proved, uh, but that's not, not hard. And uh, suppose that the first one to K rows are configurations, which yield the next, and assuming every window is legal, uh, we now want to show the induction uh, step. If row K plus one did not yield uh, row K plus two, then there is a two by three window along those two rows that is, is which is illegal. Essentially, both the, 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 the base of the induction and the induction step relies on this idea that if the first row is legal, the second one, and it, it doesn't um, uh, induce the second row, the next row, then there must be a place in which something wrong happens. And that can be proved uh, again uh, by induction. Um, so still we need to, uh, to say how do we encode this idea uh, within our formula. So the IJ uh, window of the tableau is a tuple of symbols, right? There could be some possible symbols. And we said that there are a configuration of symbols that is legal and configuration of symbols that is not legal. And we can do uh, one of two things. Uh, so the so phi move is going to be and on every uh, window, which we can do by looking at every uh, top left uh, cell of every window. So for i uh, larger one, smaller equal n to the k minus one, because you need one room to go down and j from one to n to the k minus two, two, uh, co two uh, columns to move to the right. The ij window is legal. Now we can say, we can encode this idea that the ij window is legal uh, in two ways. First one is to take the OR on all possible legal windows. So legal values A1 up to A6. And to say that uh, X, I, J, A1, N, X, I, J, plus one, A2, and so on. So the OR of A1 up to A6 that are legal, the end that tells us that this is indeed the content of these cells, or uh, something that's the same, you can look at the end on all illegal windows, and say that, okay, for every illegal uh, window, every illegal A1 up to A6, one of the possible values is wrong. So either uh, cell IJ doesn't have A1 or cell IJ plus one doesn't have A2 and so on and so forth. Perhaps you can uh, look at it more carefully. It's, it's not uh, that uh, tricky. So, uh, so this gives us a, a CNF formula, but the question is how do we get a three set, a three CNF formula? We had some long clauses in, in there. Uh, so although we have here only a CNF, it is not necessarily a three set formula or three CNF formula. And we wanted to prove three set. So for that, we only 
need to see that you can replace a long clause with the end of several short clauses. And actually as small as three. This trick doesn't work with two and that, that's actually important and interesting. So A1 or A2 or AT can be replaced is equivalent with A1 or A2 or Z1. Z is a new variable and not Z1 or A3 or Z2 and not Z2 or A4 or, A, or Z3 and so on. So we introduce new variables that we're not going to use anywhere else in the formula uh, to replace this clause with this end uh, of uh, with this small 3 and F formula. And uh, what you can see is that the first one, so any assignment A1 up to AT that satisfies the first one would satisfy that. And any assignment that satisfies this one, uh, just the A1 up to AT part of it will satisfy this one. Um, that's not hard. If there is an assignment A1 up to AT that satisfies this one, let's say A4, one of them has to be uh, true. Let's say that it's A4. And if A4 is true, then you can make not Z2 false and Z3 false. And now you can use uh, the ZIs to satisfy all the other clauses. I invite you to look how. And similarly, if you have an assignment that satisfies that, you can see that the ZIs can be responsible for almost all the clauses being satisfied, but there is at least one clause that is going to be satisfied by one of the AIs, and this AI would satisfy the first clause, A1, the original clause, A1 or A2 or A8. Um, so this hidden here, the reduction we saw so far was actually a reduction from A to SAT, and now we are uh, uh, using inside a reduction from SAT to 3 SAT. Uh, SAT is polynomial time reducible to 3 SAT. So we have a construction, we have a way to turn uh, N and W into uh, 3 CNF. The question is how uh, long is this 3 CNF? The reduction itself is polynomial time, that's not hard to argue, uh, as long as um, the formula is not too large. So we're not investing too much beyond uh, the length. So the formula is phi uh, is phi cell and phi start and phi accept and phi move. Phi cell is a order n to the 2k clauses. For every cell, we have their constant size formula. Phi start is order n to the k. It only deals with the first row. Phi accept uh, is again order n to the k, only deal with the last row. And phi move is order n to the 2k because we deal with every table, every window of, length of 2 to 2 on 3, and there are order n to the k such windows. For every window, what we have is a constant size formula. So we wanted to prove that every a in NP as a polynomial time reduction to 3 sat. Uh, for every A in NP, we know that A is decided by some non-deterministic n to the k time Turing machine n. This is the only thing we know, A is an abstract uh, language in NP. And we gave a generic model to reduce the pair nw to a 3 CNF formula phi of size order w to 2 to the k, and the construction of it is also polynomial in this uh, size. So we have order w to the 2k clauses such that satisfying assignment to the variables of phi directly corresponds to an accepting computation history of n on w. The formula phi is the end of four 3 f formulas that check various aspects of, uh, of an history. 
And I want to say that uh, uh, by now there are other um, proofs uh, of the Cook Levin theorem. We saw this proof using a tableau, pretty direct, uh, but I recommend reading uh, uh, Look at Revison's note for an alternative proof. The way that goes is by defining this notion of a circuit set. So instead of a, a formula, we look at a logical circuit. Um, and uh, so, and this formula circuit gets Boolean variables and gives either a one or is either satisfiable or not. Then you show that circuit sat is NP hard. Um, and in fact, this n by n, n to the k by n to the k tableau that we just saw can be simulated using a, a logical circuit of order n to the k uh, gates, perhaps in even a more direct uh, fashion. And, um, uh, and then you can reduce circuit sat to three sat in polytime. So this is an alternative way to get that uh, uh, three set is NP hard. And we already know that three set is, N is in NP. So conclude that three set is also NP hard and therefore that it is uh, NP complete. So the theorem that we've seen, the cook levin theorem is a set and three set are NP complete. Uh, the corollary is that set is in P if and only if P equals NP. And similarly for three set, and if we'll read Luca Trevisan's note, similarly to a, a circuit set. So, okay, but what does it mean? So, uh, can we have a very efficient algorithm for three set? Is three set solvable in order n time on a multiple Turing machine. Are there logic circuits of size 6n for 3SAT? It's amazing, uh, uh, amazingly efficient, uh, super efficient algorithms for 3SAT. Is it possible now that we know that it is NP complete? So if yes, it means that not only uh, P equals NP, but there, there are amazingly efficient and short proofs of theorems uh, that you can uh, construct. Um, this is open, so we can't even rule out, although we believe that P is different than NP, uh, we can't even uh, rule out that uh, NP can be have such an amazingly efficient algorithm, the three sat is such an amazingly efficient algorithm. So uh, in conclusion, Completeness is a powerful tool to analyze a class, and in the next video, we'll see how powerful it is. SAT is our foot in the door, just like ATM was in the previous chapter. But the question that remains is, is, is there anything else? Is there only some variance of logic, some variance of satisfiability, and everything else is easy? Uh, are there anything other that is uh, complete? And, uh, and then we saw that P versus P is widely open.